Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Starting in the name of God, who is most compassionate and merciful. Dear honorable guests, Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all. Welcome to our Hidden Treasure Seminar Series, co organized by Monash University and the Asia Pacific branch of the Ibn Arabi Society. My name is Nur al Alam and I will serve as the host of today's seminar on Ibn Arabi, one of the most influential mystics in world history. Our speaker today is a leading scholar working on Ibn Arabi's heritage. Dr. Winkle, alias Abu Munir Shoaib, started his studies on Ibn Arabi at the age of 17, which is continued at Haberford College the University of Pennsylvania and the University of South Carolina, where he earned his bachelor, master's and doctoral degrees. Later, he worked as a senior research fellow at the Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies in Malaysia. He taught at the International Islamic University in Malaysia and was senior Fulbright scholar in Islamabad, Pakistan. Published in 1995, Dr. Winkle's first book, Mystery of Purity, focused on the chapter 68 of Ibn Arabi's encyclopedia, Futuhat al makiyah the openings revealed in Mecca. His second book, Islam and the Living Law, the Ibn Arabi approach, was published in 1996 and provided in an in-depth analysis of religious hermeneutics through the lens of Ibn Arabi. Having studied Ibn Arabi's the work, the openings revealed in Mecca for over 25 years, Eric Winkle is now in the midst of an 11 year project to produce the first completing mistranslation of the enormous work. He already published three volumes of the 19 volumes of 13, seven books. Um, here is the three volumes I collected. I wish him every success and blessings in this long and highly significant journey. May Allah give him tawfiq to finish his project. Please note on this book, he holds weekly dars lessons over Zoom first Friday of every month, which you can join or find the recordings in YouTube under the title, The Futuhat Project. Also, he has many inspirational podcasts and articles available on the Ibn Arabi Society webpage, ibnarabisociety.org. We are honored to have Dr. Winkle with us to deliver the last hidden treasure seminar series of this year. His talk is titled, I am a buried treasure concealed within bracket in you, colon, Ibn Arabi's role in within bracket, our discovery of the treasure chest within bracket in our chest. As usual, after his presentation for 40 minutes, we will stop recording and we will have around 20 minutes for a Q&A session with Dr. Winkle. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Eric Winkle. Over to you now. So we can begin with the Fatiha. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Malik Yawmi Deen. Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. Ihdina Surat Al Mustaqim. Surat Al Adina An Amta Alayhim. Ghayl Maghbubi Alayhim. Waladhalin. Amin. So today we'll look at the hidden treasure of the Futuhat and we'll be I'll be saying all sorts of things and you'll say okay uh, I'll say it as if I've known this forever actually these are things that I've probably learned in the last year or two or a few more years so I'll be saying things that I've had to learn and have which I've enjoyed uh, learning tremendously we're looking at the I guess we could see the first slide 
we're looking at uh, the Futahat al makia And the key here is that there are six sections in the Futahat al makia The openings have six sections. And in those six sections, Ibn Arabi is, is accomplishing something. What he's accomplishing was something that I've only learned more recently. He's accomplishing the completion and sealing of the message that he has inherited from the Prophet Now, seal is very interesting. I, I had to learn this one also. Seal, we think about as an envelope, some wax, and we seal it. So it's done, it's ended, it's completed. And it has a kind of a deadening situation, when in, at least in English. But in Arabic, in the Arabic language, khatam means a seed which has been sealed over with soil so that it can grow. And sealing the, when you say khatam al-Qur'an, that you've completed the Qur'an, it means you've put it gently between your shoulder blades. And there it is protected. And then you are then able to live the interpretation and the reading of Qur'an. And one says, Khatam al zara that you have sealed the seed when you've covered it gently and watered it. So Ibn Arabi's mission is to seal what he has inherited so that it can grow through the, um, the lineage and the transmission to other people throughout time. And so it has to be in every language, in every religion, in every culture, and in every age. So his job is to show the universality of what the Messenger of God, Rasulullah, was sent with from the light of Muhammad to the embodied Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's the outward truth and the inward truth. The outward truth that he seals is uh, what is transmitted from Aisha. So Aisha has a third or half of the religion transmitted to us. So Aisha as the fount of outward knowledge, uh, Ibn Arabi has to deal with that, work with that, to show that it is universal for all people and all times. The inward knowledge is held by Fatima. And so Fatima is the fount of the inward knowledge, the inner lineage of this light of Muhammad truth. So Ibn Arabi has to deal and work with the inward part as well. So each of the six sections that he sees etched in light in the youth are the six sections which will show and convey the universality of Islam, the universality of this message. Okay, so uh, so we can uh, go out off the screen now and look at, and so we'll look, we'll start with the first is belief system. So belief system, he has to show that the belief system that he has inherited is not only a belief system for Arabs or for Muslims or for people of a certain place, it's universal. So he gives the first uh, belief system, which is the one that Muslims are familiar with, uh, believe in God and the books, the revealed books and the angels and all of that. And that's two or three pages. And so he, he, he'll take us through the first, uh, the first, uh, belief systems. And then after that, he'll go from the first testimony, he'll, a few pages later, he'll say, okay, now let's look at the second testimony, a more detailed testimony. And this one is one that takes, we're looking at many, many pages of all of the topics that belong in the second belief system. And then he says, the third belief system is dispersed throughout the book. So he says, the first one, this has been the doctrinal belief system of a people singled out among the family of God. As for the belief system extracted and clarified, not found elsewhere, it is something above this. We have placed this matter 
dispersed throughout the book, given that most intellects, veiled by their thinking, fall short of grasping it, because there is no divestment they can perform. So he says the third belief system, which is the universal one, is one that's dispersed throughout 10,000 pages of the book. And every time he touches on this third one throughout the book, I end up as a translator having to put lots of parentheses in because he'll say the human being, but he means humanity. And by humanity, then he means Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he'll say the pre-eternal message. And then I'll put in a parentheses light of Muhammad. Um, what he's doing, he's not mentioning these things very often or too explicitly, because he doesn't want the intellect to grab on and start arguing. So 10,000 pages is enough to make the intellect fall asleep or be lulled into a state of unawareness. And while the intellect is going, oh my goodness, another 20 pages, another 1,000 pages, another 10,000 pages, at that moment, he comes in and says, here's the third universal belief system. That universal belief system is that God, the divine, is says, I am a treasure which is concealed in you. And I love that you would recognize me in you. And so I create you and I teach you so that you will recognize me and you recognize me. And then the words of that third universal belief system, we can say that in any language, is, is the creation of this first body, this first being, being of light, who the moment this being of light is created, says there is no reality but you. There is no reality but you. And then the reality says, and you are the messenger of my reality. So that's the non-intellectual third universal belief system. And he does this so that intellects won't get involved because the hadith, I am a hidden treasure, is not one that is authenticated in its chain of transmission. So if he says, let me tell you, the most important thing for you to understand is I am a hidden treasure, the intellect will say, well, that's not a real hadith and throw you out the window. <laughs> so therefore, he has to slide this in after the intellect has fallen asleep. So, and I'm telling you this because you're all able to let your intellect fall asleep and say, okay, that's for the intellect. My soul knows that this is the truth. <laughs> so that's the, that's the belief system. So everyone who has a mission to describe universal religion or universal reality uh, starts with a belief system. And then they'll come into the legal position. So rituals and law and things you must do. And so Ibn Arabi has about a thousand, well, no, it's 2000. If it could be longer, it's at least 2000 pages of issues in the legal apparatus. So these are issues. Do you wash to your elbow above your elbow or above your elbow under the sh shoulder? Uh, every single issue in Islamic legal theory is discussed, every single one. And almost all of them, Ibn Arabi says, these are, there are differences. People have differences. Some scholars say, do this, wash to here. Some scholars say, wash to here. Some scholars say, wash up to here. So he then says, it's appropriate for this issue or issues like that that we cannot imagine disagreement, but God made this disagreement to be a kindness to his creatures and a widening of space for what they're told to do for his worship. But the legal scholars of our time fence off and impose constrictions on the people who are following the scholars in what the law has widened for them. And they say to the followers, if the, he follows the Hanafi position, 
do not search for an allowance from the Shafis for what happened to you, and so on for each legal school. This is one of the greatest disasters happening to the religion and a burden while God said he did not place on you in the religion any burden. So he doesn't want us to not accept these differences. He wants us to say there are differences. Go from this to this, find what's easiest. And every position of these hundreds and hundreds of positions, he finds their inner truth, except one position, he says, it's just wrong. And that's the position that they have about the imama, the leadership of woman. And he says that they are simply wrong. Those who say that there is a proof against the woman's leadership, uh, they are not listened to. So that he dismisses that one. He dismisses no other subject but that one. And he says, this is because we are a cosmos. And in the cosmos that I am, I have intellect, soul, and lower self. I have man, woman, and unruly child in the cosmos that is me. So as if, the, if my man is leading me in the prayer, I'm in good shape. If my woman is leading me in the prayer, I'm in good shape. I just have to make sure that the unruly child is not leading me in my life or my my. And so we have to find who's the adult in the room. So who's the adult in the cosmos? That one can lead you, man or woman. So this is the one that he says, the only one that I've found that he says, they just don't have this right. <laughs> the third thing that someone will do is ask about virtues and characteristics. And Ibn Arabi says that the Prophet said, I came to complete the virtues. And Ibn Arabi says that that means he sh is showing that virtues and characteristics are universal across all of humanity. And so Ibn Arabi's what he needs to do is show that every character is virtuous if done the right way. So envy and greed, all cultures say envy is bad, greed is bad. But he said, if you're envious of your neighbor who can recite uh, the Quran all night, that's a good envy. If you're greedy for knowledge and want more and more, that's a good greed. And so he turns it around and shows that every characteristic, every human quality is complete and it can be virtuous because the prophet showed how it's virtuous. So that's number three. Four, he's got to show that all language is universal and that revelation and humanity has a language, a one language. We can probably look at this slide now, I think slide number two. And so he looks at the throat and how language is formed. And this one is just fascinating because he, as he always does, he drops this incredible insight, which is so rich, and then just goes on to the next paragraph. And you're saying, wait a second. He just said that there are 70 phonemes. And you're thinking, well, in Arabic, there's what, 28, 29 letters. In English, there's 36. Um, in the subcontinent, we have da and ta, and we have other word, other phonemes. Uh, but 70, well, it turns out that probably is 70 is the inclusive and complete set of phonemes for human language. So he says that, so he's completely telling us about Arabic letters, but it's also 70 phonemes. And the, they start from the inside. The first sound is a, is a non-sound called ah. It's a sigh, ah. Ah never shows up at the end. It always comes from the chest, inside. And he says that the first sigh, remember we had the intellects have been put to sleep, so we can say this. I am a treasure which is hidden. I am a hidden treasure. Sigh. So the one who says I am a hidden treasure sighs because there's no one there to see what beautiful treasure this is. So he sighs and the sigh brings out a wet air called a mist. 
And so into this mist, all creation takes place. So the first sound, which is not a phoneme, is the sigh that comes from the divine. And then it goes a little bit up in the chest, through the lungs, and comes to the ha sound, ha. And ha sound is not the ha sound, it's a gentle ha sound. And then it goes through every single part of the mouth until it leaves the lips. And the last letter, right on the tip of the lips, is wa, wa, wa. So it starts out with ha and ends with wa, which is ooh, ooh, ooh. So who, who. And that's where the why the Sufis love the word who, because it goes from the deepest part of the chest, the first place, until the last part of the, the lips, which creates the last letter, which is the W, which is the wa. And so notice that it the the sound has gone through every part of the the mouth and even if it comes out as a dental that means it's finally shaped by the dental it still went through the throat even if it comes out of the labial it still came through the palate and it still came through the gutturals and so every sound passes through the entire ra range of sound making in the mouth and Ibn Arabi said, this is why Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the wav, is that last letter, because he's come through every single part of the throat and mouth and taken on all of the truths that these letters contain until he comes out as the last one. And so this is how Ibn Arabi sees that the sound is a wa, a labial, but the sound has gone through the entire throat to get there. Okay, we, we can put that down there. So that was number four, I guess. Okay, and then five. Five are the alighting places. And this is this is something that Ibn Arabi says, he's going to look at 114 alighting places, places you go and stand and sit and, and are. And 114, so you say, well, he's talking about the Quran, and he must be talking about the, the suar, the fences that are held together uh, in the 114 chapters of the Quran. But what the intellect wants to do is say, give me a verse, and then with my intellect, we're going to go to the source and find out where it came from. And Ibn Arabi says, this is not for the intellects. He's going to go to the source and tell you where the Quran came from tell you where the verse came from. So he's going to source and tell you this is the verse that came out of that source. So by doing that, um, he is, he is uh, showing that what's universal is this source. And not only that, the, then he gives a name for this place. And this place is called the special face in every created being. The special face in every created being. Can't get more universal than that. Every created being has this special face, which is where he says the Quran, the Torah, the Gospels, the Psalms, all revelations come to this special face. They come to the special face and then they come out here. And now that this is a Torah in Hebrew, here's the Psalms, here's the gospel, here's another revelation, here are the folios. So he's taking us to the special face. Now, to, to be able to, so I think I can read that part. Let's see if we have one that looks good here for that. Okay, so this is a deep within, the special face, which belongs to every created being, where all of these revelations are, are revealed. And we, the special face where everything is revealed is what we want to, we go into, we go into deep, we go deeply into. So this uh, special face that every created being has, it is a mirror um, which is humanity. So a mirror, which is humanity. Uh, if we look at the shadow play, we have a projection, a light that projects onto a puppet and the puppet gets hit by the light and the shadow gets cast onto the screen. 
So we are the puppets in the middle. The light comes, hits us, and casts a shadow onto the screen. We're here on the screen. We think of ourselves as being on the screen, um, but we're we're also the puppet, the shadow play puppet in the middle. So if we're in the middle, we're in a barzakh, we're in a membrane. And so on one side is the projection, uh, the projector, and on the other side is the projection, and we're in the middle. And so this being in the middle is what humanity does. Humanity is the one which the hidden treasure has buried itself into this puppet and saying, look at yourself and look at what's inside you. And Ibn Arabi says, when Allah says, I am a treasure concealed, treasure, kunz, means that it's reposited somewhere. So in English, we can say, oh, that's a treasure, and we can think about it as being uh, you know, a nice thing or something very special. This is a buried treasure. And so that treasure is buried somewhere. It's buried in the human being. And this is why uh, when Jesus salam, says, I do not know what is in myself, meaning, I, and then he says, I do not know, I, I do not know what is in yourself. So he says both, I know what, what is in myself, and I do not know what is in yourself. Now, when someone like Jesus or Muhammad Sallallahu says, I do not know what is in yourself, yourself is the self that you have t appropriated to yourself. So it's speaking to God. So yourself means the self that I am, which you appropriate and call it yours. So the self which is in me, buried inside, is yourself because it's myself, but you, God, have said it's mine. And by saying it's mine and appropriating it, now I say, your, I do not know what's in yourself. Yourself is endless. Yourself is never fully understood. Yourself is always something that is treasured and opening up and, and being discovered. So the human being as humanity then is the mirror in the middle or is the puppet in the middle. So here in our business, so the capital he now is going to be for God. So he knows about the human being and what you are amid, what the complete human being does not know about oneself. So this one is the unseen of the true. So you, as a complete human being, are the unseen of the true. You are the reb, the unseen of the true. So we think about reb, unseen, so far away, so inaccessible and all that. Where's the unseen? There's the unseen. And I don't know what's in my unseen, because it's Allah's unseen. Because this one is the projected likeness. Therefore, Combine the statement of Muhammad sallam, and the statement of Jesus sallam, into a single matter. And this is the statement of Jesus. And I do not know what is in the self of yours, capital Y, and the statement of Muhammad sallam, or a name in your knowledge of your unseen that you have appropriated to you. So there's a name that I have not found yet that you are going to give me. It's in yourself, meaning it's inside here. So this carrying something inside uh, is the word in Arabic is hamal, which is the same word for pregnant. So when you carry a baby, you are hamal and you are carrying uh, this truth, this self, this divine self. And the lineage the ones who carry this for the lineage, uh, in, in our lineage, we call them mothers. They're the ones who carry this teaching in, their, in the lineage. And, it, and what they're carrying is this third belief system, the universal belief system that there is a reality, the reality loves to be recognized, the reality created beings who could recognize that and that this reality placed in them and said, that's myself, which is yours, but it's myself. And this is what you discover and uncover. And as you 
unbury and discover this treasure, you discover the treasure that God is. And so what the teaching is, is God wants us to un, unbury and discover the treasure which is inside. And that the teaching is then carried by the people in the lineage. Now, for Ibn Arabi then, as someone who is a khatam, someone who's sealing all this, he's making seeds and then covering them over with soil and gently watering them so that they will grow. And then they will carry this teaching from one person to another, to another, to another. And so what's interesting is that the people that he happened to, right, well, let's quickly, so universal. Say one more, we forgot, I forgot to say about the 114th Basmala. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It starts every chapter of the Quran, except for one. So people ask, where is the 114th Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? And Ibn Arabi says, the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which is the 114th, has been carried by Bilqis, the Queen of Sheba. Bilqis has carried this. And she's carried it not in Arabic, because she said something like, Bismi al, her name for God is al, like the Hebrew el. And so she's been carrying the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim of the Quran, the 114th one, by herself in another language and out and before the advent of this thing called Islam. This is the universal carrying of this message. She carried in another language, in another culture, in another religion, she carried Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So the ones carrying it, it's very interesting to see who did Ibn Arabi, what seeds did he plant? And I think you'll, uh, most of us who are attracted to Ibn Arabi's works were often on the margins. Well, it's definitely true that Ibn Arabi planted the seeds into very marginal kind of people. <laughs> and, so, and yet, look at that, it still survived. We have his lineage to this day in all of the Sufi paths, have that lineage. He planted that seed of, and that teaching, uh, in, in he describes that, in the poetry of the Hirqa. The Hirqa is the cloak of honor. And this cloak of honor is what in North Africa was given um, for graduation ceremonies. And even to this day, when you graduate, you get a sash, right? And you get a gown and you get a pestle and mortar or whatever it's called, <laughs> but you get a gown. And that gown is the Hirqa. And it means that your teacher puts the gown on you, says, this guy's a PhD, he did what he's supposed to do. And so, this lineage, this transmission of lineage, Ibn Arabi has a series of poems that uh, we're starting to translate them right now from the critical edition of the Diwan. And the first one says, wear the cloak of honor, wear it. It's a second person imperative, you, you wear this cloak. There's the universality. There's not like, he just starts with, you, humanity, everyone, anyone who hears this, you wear this cloak. I want to give this cloak, this teaching to you. The second one, he describes his, his own cloak that was given to him. He describes his self, his situation. The third one is Umm Muhammad, is a woman named Mother of Muhammad, some, uh, some woman that he gave the cloak to, and he describes her. The fourth one is Radia a woman named Radia. And then later on, there are other, the rest of them are women or girls. There's some that, as he's try, talking about the poem, these seem to be very young girls. They're not, you know, not the mature women. They're very young girls. And then there's a man in there. Well, it's Badr, it's the freed slave. And so the only man in there is the freed slave on the margins. So <laughs> those are the people he gave the teaching to. And they're the ones who, alhamdulillah, they really did their job because we have that teaching to this day. So let me read the two, the two uh, poems that he's got, two of the poems. So this is the investiture. I invested Safiya with the cloak 
of us poor ones, when she was adorned with the adornment of the trusted ones. She came with every excellent, and she transcended her opposites coming from mere examination. And she completed perfectly her virtues, and she became sanctified, and she perfumed herself with the entirety of the divine names. The spirits came to her in her niche, as they did with Mary. So she is Betul, purely dedicated, a sister of the Virgin. She is protected like the pearl, no thought of doubt. She is constant, sound of judgment, a red anemone. The angels of the heaven descended to give her good tidings one night to bestow the inheritance of the lineage. So protected like the pearl is the image of Khatam al-Qur'an, when you protect the Qur'an by putting it memorized between your shoulder blades. And then the second one, I invested my daughter Safri with a cloak from the family of beautiful manners. I clothed her with the clothing of God awareness, taqwa, based on every creation inducing wonder. And I said, my daughter, Travel with me on my path and with my course. The course is the law of the prophet, the Hashemi, the Arabi. This is how I closed her, clothed her with the cloak, based on every generous chosen teacher. I declare this, and I am Muhammad ibn al-Arabi. So alhamdulillah, I mean, thank you. And here's a transmission from in New York. Thank you.